Good morning and welcome to the Beverly Presbyterian Church. How's everybody today? Feeling well preserved with the cold air? Yeah, I, I love this time of year. It's my favorite. Um, a couple of announcements that are not up on our board. Uh, movie night is this Friday. Oh, doors open at 6 and the um, movie starts at 6.30 and the movie is The Munsters. It's the 2022 movie about the TV series The Munsters. So that looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. And then on December the 3rd, which is Saturday, we're moving our Friday movie night from Friday to Saturday that month, and we are doing a combined uh, program with the Hoff Family Arts Foundation, and it will be uh, the classic It's a Wonderful Life in black and white, like the original, like it was supposed to be shown. Um, and at the same time, you'll have the opportunity to build gingerbread houses. Now, the event is free. However, you do need to register in advance because there are a limited number of gingerbread house spaces available. However, if you don't want to make a gingerbread house and you still want to see the movie, by all means come out. Uh, you don't have to register for that part, just for the gingerbread houses, and that is done on the Ha Family Arts website. So please uh, refer to um, the various things around the building that show you about that. And we'll start with some announcements. So the flowers today are dedicated um, by the Utsi family in memory of Layla Jean and Har Harry Utsi and by Doug and Dina Allen in memory of their parents. If you need to have pastor care or you just like to talk to the pastor, uh, he is available uh, anytime with his cell phone number that's displayed up on the screen for you at home as well as here in the church. And he does keep office hours so you can just drop in and see him from uh, 10 to 12 on Monday and Wednesday, 5 to 7. Uh, stewardship. We've talked about this a lot and obviously uh, nobody really wants to talk about money in church, but it is an important factor in any ministry, regardless of how uh, bare bones it is or how sophisticated it is, finances are an important part. Uh, it was a part of Jesus' ministry as well, because they did have a certain amount of finances that were kept, and those were used as they needed them. Uh, we do expect God to provide, but by the same token, we have to assist his efforts as well. Now, you can see that we did very well last week, and I want to thank everyone for digging deep. Uh, we do need to average $3,368 per week. Last week, our pledges and plate did come in at a higher number, so thank you very much, but we can't take our foot off the pedal. Uh, when I'm at work, we have to focus on certain things from time to time to make adjustments to how we're doing as a business. And uh, while the church is not a business, we also have to focus on things from time to time to make sure that we are heading in the right direction, either spiritually or financially. So this is one of those uh, things that we need to focus on financially. Spiritually, we are working on our purpose. I hope everybody's been uh, thinking about that and coming up with their three words and doing all of that kind of stuff because we'll have some more exercises on that as we move along. Uh, don't forget to change your clocks. I love changing the clocks in the fall because I get an extra hour of sleep. Lately, my dog has been waking me up a lot, so there's a good chance I won't actually get that extra hour of sleep, but I'm hoping that uh, I do. So don't forget to set your clock back one hour uh, Saturday night so you're not uh, at church at the wrong time. The newsletter, which is a phenomenal publication, I don't say that just because my wife is involved. It actually is a very, very well put together newsletter. I've seen ones from different churches, and this is by, by hands down one of the best newsletters that churches put out, it's certainly in our area, if not all around the country. So please gather up your copy. Um, we will mail off those that don't get picked up, but if you pick it up, it does save the church the postage. Again, our family movie night is The Monsters, and this is sort of the prequel to the TV series. So this is how Lily and Herman get together, and uh, it's supposed to be a, a really fun movie, and hopefully we'll enjoy that immensely. We kind of tied it into the, we're, we're in Halloween period, so. Um, the other announcement I have is Operation Christmas Child, which are the shoe boxes. We've talked about that a little bit. And um, Kim Peacock is in charge of that. She's taken the reins on that. And um, there is a flyer that many of you have in your bulletins. But basically, um, 
We have pre-ordered 50 shoe boxes, but you're more than welcome to use your own. We also, also have pre-ordered 50 of the sticky labels, which you talked about in that video. And um, you can reach out to Kim if you have any questions. The pickup for these is November the 13th, so they have to be in preferably before the 13th of November. So you've got a little bit of time yet to do those. It's a wonderful ministry. There is a $10 donation asked for with each box to help get it to its location. And that would be done as a check or a money order. Do not put cash in the boxes. That would be create a problem. But please, by all means, um, participate that if you can. Any other announcements from anybody in the congregation? And not hearing anybody at home screaming out an, an announcement, I'm assuming that they're, they're good too. So I'm going to turn the... Um, service over to Pastor Keith. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed one other thing. Uh, on our prayer list, please keep Pat Doherty, Sybil Moore, Tom and Jane Birch, Julia Dolce, uh, Casey Torres, Barbara Judd, Barbara Herman, Noel Rainey, Jane Schultz, Joy Dottamine, uh, Lois Chenker, Gary Christopher, Jared, Caden and Payton's father, a little bit of glare there, Ryan Kimball, Eileen Schmidt, um, obviously our church purpose and finances and anyone else who is suffering from illness, disease, or distraught in your prayers. Oh, and Bob Hill. Uh, let's always remember Bob. Um, very, very good steward of our property and uh, we love him dearly, so keep him in our prayers as well. Anything else? All right. Did you want me to leave these for you? Did you want these? Okay. Will you join me responsible then our call to worship? Our help is in the name of the Lord, who created the heavens and the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Grace you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I have a praise this morning in selection number 35. To God be the glory. Number 35, please.
Praising the Lord is certainly commendable, worthwhile, and yet many people treat themselves as if they are the Lord, and their behavior is not so commendable. We are amongst those people, and therefore as individuals and as a congregation, let us join together to confess our sin to God. Let us pray. Holy God, Throughout the ages, you have come to your people desiring to enjoy communion and fellowship with them. But we, O God, have set up impediments. We have relied upon our own strength and will. We failed to appreciate your grace and love, especially as made manifest in Christ Jesus. And our lives reflect a sense of loss of direction and purpose. Forgive us, O God, not because we deserve it, because your Son has merited for us your grace and pardon. Write your will upon our hearts so that we may serve you more faithfully, reform and transform our lives so that we may live in the light of the truth that sets us free. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The just, then, will live by faith in the crucified Son of God, who freely offered his life as a ransom for human sin, thereby affording us grace upon grace. Believe these words. It's good news. Go forth to serve our Lord in peace. Indeed, that we might serve God as God desires. We've been given instructions as to how to live our lives when he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This, Jesus said, is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. In these two rules are summarized all the law and the prophets. Amen. The Old Testament lesson this morning is taken from the prophecy of Jeremiah, beginning with verse 31 of chapter 31. Hear these words. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, because they will, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is the first lesson. And the New Testament lesson is taken from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, beginning with verse 21 of chapter 3. Hear these words. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Here ends the readings 
May God open our hearts and minds to the message. This time, Joel favors with a backyard Bible message. Hello. Welcome to the Halloween edition of Backyard Bible. Well, thank you. I have lost some weight. I went on a little bit of a diet because I know I'm going to be eating a lot of candy and I wanted to short make sure that I made some room. Have you ever wondered why we're so obsessed with Halloween? Why people have so much fun uh, decorating their yards and getting involved in ghosts and goblins and things like that? Well, honestly, a lot of it's the candy. You know, most of it's the candy. But there's also this need that human beings have to understand death, to try and conquer it. They're afraid of it. They want to be able to last longer, to go on beyond their own lives. And I think a lot of people just don't realize that they really have access to that. All they have to do is believe in Jesus, that he's their savior, and repent sins, and uh, be honest about that, and they will have eternal life. They don't have to think about ghosts and goblins and vampires and the undead, because they will live forever. And unfortunately, a lot of people today have lost track of that, and they tend to focus more on things like Halloween. So this year, when you're out trick-or-treating, remember that it is actually all about the candy, and uh, also know that you don't have to worry about ghosts and goblins because you have eternal life through our Savior, Jesus Christ, and uh, his gift to us from God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, please bless us and help us to have fun on Halloween while remembering the importance of you in our lives because you are our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And until next time, that's Backyard Bible. Oh, by the way, I think after I eat all that candy, the next time you see me, I'll put back all that weight and maybe a little bit more.
Will you join me in a spirit of prayer? Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and may the thoughts, the meditations, and the reflections of this your congregation find acceptance and pleasure in your sight or our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Justification by faith, salvation by grace alone. One might even say goodness without or apart from goodness. Those words are the mantra of the Protestant Reformation. The idea they represent harkens back to Martin Luther. But for his part, Martin Luther didn't always believe these words. In fact, if he had, he might never have gone into the priesthood in the first place. The story is not an unfamiliar one. Martin Luther, like his eventual counterpart, John Calvin, went to university with the intention of studying law. His father, Hans, was hopeful that, Hart, that Martin would help to elevate the family from the peasant class to the upcoming middle class. Hans himself had done much in this regard, for he was a leaseholder of copper mines and smelters, as well as serving as a citizen representative to the local council. Well, Martin made good progress in his studies, and after a few years, he earned a master's degree. And with his father's blessing, Martin then enrolled in law school. But the study of law left Luther uncertain about himself and his destiny. It was while Luther was traveling from his parents' home back to the University of Erfurt on July 2nd, 1507, that a bolt of lightning struck really close to Luther and his mount. Luther was thrown to the ground, breathless, terrified. Fearing for his life, Luther uttered a vow to St. Anne, the patron saint of minors, which was, of course, the vocation of his father. St. Anne, Luther cried, save me. I'll become a monk. Well, Luther was spared, and he remained true to his word. He held a farewell party with some close friends, sold his books and other possessions, and presented himself at an Augustinian monastery. There Luther would throw himself into the life of a monk. But being a monk wasn't easy for Luther. He wrestled with God, perhaps like Jacob at Jabbok Creek, which we talked about a few weeks ago, trying to find peace with God. Luther viewed God rather as a divine tyrant who was justly angry with anyone who committed even the most menial of sins. So Luther gave himself even more ardently to his life as a monk, he engaged in self-denial, increasing discipline, with more fasting and more praying and more reading of the scriptures. And still Luther feared for his eternal salvation. He was haunted by the fear of eternal damnation. He re repented of his sins as best he knew how, but still he found it impossible to believe that he was truly pardoned of those sins. Well then, seven years after forsaking the outside world for the cloistered life of a monk, Luther was sent to Rome to transact some business down there. For Luther, this was a moment of high expectation. He was going to what he imagined to be the center of both piety and power for the church he loved. When Luther arrived in Rome, he did receive a revelation, though it was hardly the sort he anticipated. Instead of finding a church of exemplary devotion and conduct, Luther discovered a very worldly church weighted down by corruption. Luther's mind and heart were sent reeling. He was sorely disappointed. Nevertheless, a shaken Luther did what he thought he should do. He made his way to the cathedral and began climbing the Scala Sancta, the holy stairs. 
As he climbed the stairs, he kissed each one, as is customary and as he'd been taught. But in a few minutes, a verse of scripture began to ring out in his memory. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And Luther wondered, what am I doing kissing these stairs? The just shall live by faith. And thus began a personal transformation that was to transform the Christian church to this very day. Later, Luther would write, it was as if the gates swung open and I entered paradise. When Luther returned to Germany, he was assigned to teach at a new university in Wittenberg. There, Luther continued to search the scriptures, and Luther became convinced that something was wrong, mightily wrong, with the practices of the church he had grown to love and was intending to serve as a monk. A visit by the Dominican monk Johann Tetzel to the neighboring realm to where Luther was serving became the catalyst for Luther to make public his reservations and concerns about then current practice in the church. Johann Tetzel came with a powerful message. He'd been delegated by Rome to raise funds for the construction of a new basilica, which would be the Basilica of St. Peter, which stands prominently yet in Rome today. Tetzel developed a short, somewhat crasp, excuse me, somewhat crasp poem, which proved powerful in procuring the funds he was directed to collect. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, he would say, the soul from purgatory springs. Well, this indulgence was purportedly effective not only for the dead, but also for the living. Persons with low morals were convinced that they had nothing to worry about in terms of procuring their eternal salvation, and they could carry on with their misdeeds and sins and still obtain life with God in eternity. Luther was appalled. He was stimulated to compose and propose an academic debate on the subject. So he wrote 95 theses, or statements, relative to the matter, posted them in Latin on the castle church doors in Wittenberg, and awaited the opportunity to debate his theses. For better, for worse, Luther's theses were quickly translated into German, the vernacular language, of course, and widely disseminated. People began debating the merits of the issues which Luther was raising. And to a certain extent, we continue to debate those issues today. And still, for Luther, the die had been cast. His ideas gained traction in the German realm. Luther regularly defended his views, for example, at the Diet of Worms back in 1521. Theological heavyweights were invoked to counter the ideas which Luther was promulgating. But Luther remained convinced, or rather unconvinced, that anything he was advocating was contrary to scripture. And that was his standard. And so he took his stand. Here, stay, here I stand, he said. It was for him, for such a moment as this, that he had been born. The Luther was spreading his ideas within the realm of the church, which is what Luther intended. The ideas he was advocating had far-ranging, far-ranging, excuse me, implications. Not a few of those implications were political in nature. Luther was protected in his study and work by Frederick the Wise, who was one of the six electors of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, personally, I don't know of a a time or place where it's been popular for anyone to pay taxes, especially taxes to a foreign or out of sight realm. People north of the Alps were becoming restive of contributing to causes which benefited only those south of the Alps, primarily in Italy. And political leaders saw the potential of redirecting funds which had been going south into their own realms. The Protestant Reformation was initiated by Martin Luther as a religious cause, but it benefited from political issues 
And it's naive to think otherwise. On the other hand, Luther himself, though the face of the Reformation, exercised influence outside the realm of religion as well. Luther made an important contribution to the German literature with his translation of the Bible into the vernacular, into German. My German professor in college suggested that Luther, along with the 19th century German literary giant Goethe, were the two most significant persons in promoting and defining good German language. Luther would eventually write over 400 works, all the way from pamphlets to major books. He wrote catechisms for the common people and introduced singing by the congregation into the life of the church. Of the 125 hymns that Luther personally wrote, the best known, which will be our hymn of departure today, is a mighty fortress is our God. Luther certainly had quite a string of accomplishments for a man who entered the priesthood because he'd been struck by a bolt of lightning. Today's church can give thanks for that providential storm and Luther's misinterpretation concerning it. It's also noteworthy that on October 31st, 1999, that is, on the anniversary of Luther's posting his 95 Theses, representatives of the Lutheran World Federation and the Roman Catholic Church signed a document called, quote, Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. Unquote. This document states that the two Christian traditions have reached a consensus on basic truths on the doctrine of justification. Specifically, the document highlights a sharing, quote, a common understanding of our justification by God's, faith, God's grace through faith in Christ, unquote. In essence, this document affirms that Luther was right and we are justified by faith. That is, that we are saved not by our works, but through faith in the atoning sacrificial death of Christ the Lord. That, my friends, is a remarkable confluence. And it's made more remarkable by the fact that the World Methodist Church, or World Methodist Council, rather, adopted the declaration in 2006. And the World Communion of Reformed Churches of which the Presbyterian Church USA is a member, adopted it in 2007. And yet, tragically, half a millennium after Luther, there are many followers of Christ, disciples of Jesus, who still have not made the discovery that transformed Luther's life. In one of his books, the late Dr. Norman Vincent Peale was talking about a young man in North Carolina named Samuel Mann, who was tramping through the countryside. Being somewhat in a hurry, Samuel decided to go through a swamp rather than taking a wide detour. He had high hip boots and was slogging through the wet ground when he came to what looked like an area of dry sand. As he tried to cross it, Suddenly, he sank down to his knees. As he tried to get back, a powerful suction gripped his legs like a vice, dragging him even deeper down. In a moment of horror, Samuel realized that he had stepped into a pocket of quicksand. And he remembered what the natives would say, nobody ever gets out of those quicksands alive. For a moment, Samuel was paralyzed by panic, seeking deeper and deeper. To his left, though, he saw some grass, some marsh grass, each blade perhaps half an inch wide. And he thought to himself, if I could just reach that grass, perhaps a handful would have the strength of a rope. He reached out his hand but it was about three inches short of any of the blades of grass. He knew that if he lunged for the grass and missed it, he would disappear 
under the treacherous sinking sand. And yet if he did nothing, he was doomed as well. At this point, the sand was almost over the top of his hip boots. And suddenly he realized that it wasn't the sand that was holding him in place. Rather, the sand was holding his boots, which in turn were holding him. With shaking fingers, Samuel undid the straps that were holding his boots to his belt. And then taking a deep breath and asking God to help him, he flung himself full length out of his boots across the deadly sand. His fingers touched some marsh grasp. Desperately, he grasped several strands. Then slowly, ever so slowly, and carefully, inch by agonizing inch, he pulled himself out of the boots and onto solid earth. He was safe. It had been an enormous struggle, yet he was safe. That's a tale pretty much of how many people regard Christian faith. Are you a Christian, someone may ask? And perhaps a little embarrassment, we answer, well, I I try to be. It's like we're saying, let me just stretch for a few more strands of grass, and I think I'll make it. And in the process, we miss the joy of the gospel. The gospel is not about our desperately reaching out to prove our virtue to God. That's what Martin Luther had tried to do. And in it, he failed. But the gospel is about God. A God who reaches down to us in love and mercy and forgiveness. It is a God who pulls us out of the quicksands of sin and self-destruction. It is not an accomplishment which we somehow pull off by ourselves. Another illustration of this. Douglas Steer tells about a, a long visit he had in the early 1930s with the theologian Karl Barth in Bonn, Germany. During the conversation, Steer spoke about the role of private prayer as a means of putting us into the stream of grace. He spoke of how impressed he had been by the daily devotional life of the Benedictine monks as a means of expressing that grace. Steer obviously was expecting Professor Bart to be moved by these vital signs of piety, as Steer himself had been moved. Bart, though, for his part, would have none of it. As he had rebuked, his personal friend and comrade, Emil Bruder, in 1934, with a publication of his essay simply entitled Nine, which means no, to natural theology. Bart denied that either prayer or ritual had anything at all to do with redemption. Neither of these will save us, he insisted. He said that for himself he knew that he hung suspended between heaven and hell. He knew that the weight of his sins would most certainly sink him as well into hell. Only the intervention of the supreme act of grace wrought in Christ Jesus would he ever find redemption sufficient for him. Only Christ could overcome the terrible gravitational force of his sin. He implied that this act of Jesus Christ was enough, that anything else was utterly irrelevant and redundant, and that anyone who wasted his time or trust on such practices was to be pitied. Well, those are strong words from Professor Bart, and I can well imagine how he might have uttered them. And to some, he might very well have overstated his case a bit. But there is a very meaningful place for prayer and personal devotion in the Christian life. And still, Bart's point is well taken. Our prayers won't save us. Our perfect attendance in worship won't save us. This means that ultimately, there is only one prayer to be prayed, and that is this. Yes, Lord, I accept your acceptance of me. For no one loves us like God loves us. 
No one wants us to experience the healing and wholeness of grace like our Heavenly Father wants us to. Even our earthly mothers and fathers don't long for our salvation like God longs for it. God has provided a way, marsh grass for us, if you will, and that way is Jesus. The manager of an opera house once received a phone call from a woman following her performance. She was a bit desperate. She had lost a diamond pin and she was wondering whether it might still be in the theater. Well, the manager asked her to wait on the line while he and some others looked in the same area in which the woman had been seated. And sure enough, in a few minutes, someone came across the beautiful piece of jewelry. And yet when the manager returned to the phone to tell the lady the good news, the line was dead. The lady had hung up. And amazingly, she never called back. Though the pin had been found, the manager was unable to return the pin and give her happiness. That's sad, even tragic. And yet likewise, how sad it is to realize that the eternal God who created the heavens, the earth, the seas, and all that fills them, has provided a way for us to know our sins are forgiven and further to know the joy of God's presence in our lives. Yet many still live defeated lives, desperate lives, empty lives, because they refuse to hear God's good news. Someone suggested that Columbus discovered a new world. Copernicus discovered a new heaven, and Luther, a new God, a God gracious for the sake of the work of his son, Christ Jesus. Salvation is by faith alone. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, and you can live life abundant. Let us pray. On this Reformation Sunday, O God, we thank you, for we are reminded of the truth of your word, the gospel, the good news of Christ Jesus, that he came into our midst, even to the point where he would allow himself to be crucified on a cross, to serve as a sacrifice for our wrongdoings. We have been redeemed, O God. Help us never to take that for granted and help us to be faithful stewards of that good news, that great news to people in this church, to people in this community, and people to the uttermost parts of the earth. For it is in the name of Jesus we pray it. Amen. I invite you at this time to stand and give affirmation to our Christian faith as we recite together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. For men shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. How do you respond when somebody does something really good for you? You say thank you, and you give oftentimes an offering to symbolize those thanks. 
This time our gifts, our tithes and offerings will be received. We have been blessed, O God, blessed most especially by the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus. And so we pray that in his spirit, we might be a similar blessing unto the others. So use our gifts, our tithes and our offerings, and even ourselves to promote your word and your will in this community, this world. For we dedicate them in the service of your Son, our Savior, Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen. I'm not certain who gave me the blue card, but I understand that Wednesday is a big day for Charlie and Betty. It will be their 65th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Congratulations. You two have been an inspiration for many, many here at this church and in this community. So we thank you for your dedication to one another and to other good causes. And we congratulate you. Let us join in the spirit of prayer. Let us pray. We are blessed, O oh God. We are blessed with the gift of life as individuals 
and within groups. And especially we are graced with the gift of life through this church and its ministry. Lord, we thank you for those who have proven to be a blessing to the ministry of this church for more than its 150 years. Not one single individual, but many individuals working in concert, coordinating their efforts to build up the body of Christ here at 121 East Warren, but also to the uttermost parts of the earth. We pray your continued blessing upon this church, O oh God. May it continue to be a faithful witness and a faithful servant to you and your wishes for the best in this world. Lord, we know that all is not good in this world. There's division, there's strife, there's even open warfare. While we ask for forgiveness of those who perpetuate war, O oh God, we pray to those who are victims of that war, and even those who will suffer hungry, hunger because food will not be distributed as it could be or should be. Lord, help us to be faithful stewards, all of us, the whole human race, to be faithful stewards of the food and the grace you give to us. We pray to O God for those who may not feel so great today, who are in beds of illness, perhaps even in hospital. Remember Bob. And we pray a blessing upon Pat and the surgeon who will operate upon her as an extension of your fingers. Be with Lois, Tom and Jane. Julia, Casey, Noel, Barbara, Jane, Joy, Ryan, Sybil, Gary, Barbara, Jared, with all those, oh God, especially those within our midst who need you in special ways to promote healing. Bless the work of those who minister to them and help us, O oh God, as we seek to, to be helpful to them in their time of recuperation. We pray too, O oh God, for those who grieve and mourn. For death has visited people within this church in recent weeks, O oh God. May they grieve but not, O oh God, as those who have no hope. For remember that in Christ Jesus, we have hope for this life and beyond. Help us, O oh God, to be faithful with all you give us, especially your word of truth, your word of love, expressed most vividly through Christ Jesus, your Son, our Savior, who came into our midst and taught us how to live, lived exemplary, and then taught us how we might pray together when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of departure is a popular one, a powerful one. A mighty fortress is our God, number three.
the prince of darkness grim. We tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. Powerful words. But power for that comes in part from us. We become instruments of God's grace, God's power to this community, to the world. Remember that. You are an instrument for God's grace and peace. May the blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, 